to a bit of a heads up about the um, Sermon on the Mount. Um, the photo that's there, some of you will recognise, it's at the it's at the place in the just by the Sea of Galilee, as you can see, the Sea of Galilee in the distance there, not very far away. Um, this is a little bump which they call the Mount of the Beatitudes. In other words, in the spiritual imagination of the local church in the Holy Land, this is the hill where they imagine the Sermon on the Mount being given. Mm. And there's a beautiful chapel there, which well, I'm obviously standing on the Grand Rock, looking down the lake, and it's the chapel of the Beatitudes. And so it's a, it's a beautiful place, beautiful gardens, has nothing to do with where Jesus said the words, but it's a beautiful place to be and to reflect on the challenge of the Sermon on the Mount. So, um, let's think a little bit about this, the great sermon or the, the Sermon on the Mount. We find it in Matthew's Gospel. It takes up uh, chapters five, six, and seven in Matthew's Gospel. It's actually one of the five sections in Matthew Gospel, Matthew's Gospel called the Discourses. In other words, there are five times in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus prayed, where the action stops, like a film director, and the, uh, the key character, Jesus, gives a long talk, like a themes forum. Jesus is stopping. Uh, first of those is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the second one is chapter 13 of Matthew, where you get a whole collection of parables and so on. Uh, there's one in chapter 18, which is about uh, life within the church community and discipline and so on. And that's where we get the saying where two or three are gathered together. Okay, that's from that chapter 18. And there's another one uh, in chapter 24. And, and there's a, the, also in chapter 23, you get Jesus having a, a tirade against the Pharisees. Okay? So you have these set pieces that Matthew puts at different points through his, through his gospel. The first of these, and the longest of these, is the Sermon on the Mount, which is in chapter 5, 6, and 7. Some of the same material occurs in Luke's gospel, but we call it the Sermon on the Plain, not because we're being funny, but because in Luke it actually says, and Jesus came down and stood on a level place, and he said to them, blessed are you who are poor, and so on. Mm -hmm. Hang on. <laughs> it's the same material, but it's no longer up a mountain. Okay, now it's not all of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. What Matthew has gathered together in 5, 6, and 7, Luke has bits and pieces all over the gospel. And certainly there's no hint in Luke that Jesus goes up a mountain, but for Matthew, who's very Jewish, Moses goes up a mountain to get the law, Elijah goes up a mountain for his, um, for his encounter with God, so the idea of Jesus going up a mountain works in a Jewish context. In the, in the uh, document, which doesn't exist as a separate document, but in the um, hypothetical document called the, um, the same gospel, Q, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we actually find some of the same material. And in fact, Q is a series of sermons. No miracles, no other, no other action, just a whole series of sermons and teachings of Jesus. And there's in um, some of the early fathers, particularly Ignatius, who was a bishop of Antioch, who was martyred around about 115 thereabouts, he talks about knowing the logia or the sayings of the Lord. Now, was that a version of the Sermon on the Mount? We don't know. Was that, was that in fact Q? I mean, we just don't know, but he talks about the collection of the sayings of the Lord, the logia. So there's material floating around, but the most, the most um, impressive collection is what we find in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Why is this stuff working? Okay, it's changing down there, but it's not changing on the screen. That's a bit of worry. Is that true? What's happening? Oh, there you go. Okay, so I'll have to maybe stand over here. Okay, so for some reason this is it's just lost the... Uh, 
who have done that. So, um, in what's, what I'm doing here, I'm drawing particularly on um, commentaries by two um, European scholars. One of them is a guy whose surname is Betz, and the other one is Lutz, L U Z. So, this is a comment from Ernst Betz in his commentary. And you can see already by this stage he's up to page 1106. So it's a pretty substantial book. Okay. And he's talking about this phrase, the Sermon on the Mount. And he's saying, well, it's, the Sermon on the Mount means that particular text in Matthew, but in the public mind, and for his bit, and he's written a commentary just on the Sermon on the Mount, um, and in, but in this press of debate, it means that group of text, that group of material which sets out Jesus' pretty uncompromising ethics, which contrast with the, um, the theology about Jesus, which we find in the Christian church after Easter. Okay, so he's talking, it's just not a, so the Sermon on the Mount is not things we say about Jesus, but things that the early church remember Jesus saying. Okay, and in Matthew's case they Collected it up. So it's that, it's um, this idea that it's the teach. So for some people, they're more interested in the teachings of Jesus than the person of Jesus. And we'll see a couple of examples of that in a moment. Okay, let's come back to cycle work again. If you do a, a Google search, a simple Google search for Sermon on the Mount, in about 0 0.24 seconds, you'll find 1.3 million. <laughs> responses, hits. There's a lot of stuff out there about the Sermon on the Mount. It's a really big meme. Okay? And yes, it means Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but it also means the teaching of Jesus. It's come to have a bigger kind of meaning. All right. So I'm going to look at a couple of characters in history that have really helped to um, make the Sermon on the Mount popular theme that it is. This is actually a, a representation, I'm sure he didn't look like this, but this is a representation of Augustine of Hippo, who I mentioned in the sermon this morning. He was actually the person who invented the phrase Sermon on the Mount. So he lived from 350s to 430, I mentioned his death earlier today. He wrote a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount and he called it the Sermon on the Mount. That's where the word comes from. Matthew doesn't call it that. Okay? So it's, all, it's, again, it's interesting. We, we know what the Sermon on the Mount means, mm -hmm. but if you bumped into Matthew and said, gee, I really love what you did with the Sermon on the Mount, he'd go, what? What are you talking Oh, you mean chapters five? Well, there were no chapters either, of course, in the first editions. So he writes this, uh, Simon and Domini in Monte, a sermon the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. So he kind of creates this idea that the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is different from the other bit in the Gospels where Jesus is teaching. Greg, is that Latin? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Which, of course, Jesus didn't speak, but Augustine yeah. did. <laughs> okay. And so he wrote that commentary um, in the 390s, basically. 30 odd. 34 years before he died, so he's still quite a young man. Then we skip down to Martin Luther. So, you know, around about late 1400s, early 1500s, he gave a series of weekly sermons on Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and his students made notes, and although he didn't publish it, they did, and he wrote a preface. So his lectures on the Sermon on the Mount um, were published, and he particularly focuses on the Sermon on the Mount as a, uh, it's about, about discipleship and it's about the ethics of the disciples of Jesus. That's a theme we'll come back to. Albert Schweitzer, a great missionary, medical doctor, New Testament scholar, and also musician, an amazing prodigy of a guy. He was particularly inspired by the Sermon on the Mount but he developed, it, he developed the idea that the Sermon on the Mount was not how you would normally live, but it's how you would live while you're waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount includes things like turn the other cheek, and if somebody asks for your coat, give them your shirt as well, and all that sort of stuff. So when you, 
you can't really live like this 24 7 but if you're waiting for the kingdom to come very very soon you can make a special effort and live like this okay a bit like paul saying in corinthians uh, it'd be better not to be married because jesus is coming back soon but that's not going to work over hundreds of years so he developed the idea that um, these radical and demanding requirements were suitable for the little bit of time left in Jesus' thinking before the arrival of the kingdom. But Jesus was wrong. The kingdom didn't come, so we can forget about the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? For, for Albert Schweitzer, Jesus is a kind of, um, kind of sort of gone... Uh, He's a sort of, uh, what's, what's the, uh, the figure from the, 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 you know, the Spanish guy, Don Quixote? He's, a, he's charging the windmill um, of history, uh, but he's wrong. He's a brave guy, but he's wrong. That's, that's Albert Schweitzer's view. And Albert Schweitzer then said, well, um, that didn't work, but he developed his own ethic of reverence for all life. And that was enough inspiration for him to go off to Africa and set up a hospital and spend the rest of his life there. But he came to the view that the Sermon on the Mount was not something we had to really practice. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, um, similarly, was inspired by the Sermon on the Mount. And there's this fascinating quote from him. The message of Jesus, says Gandhi, as I understand it, stand it is contained in the Sermon on the Mount, unadulterated, taken as a whole. So here's two people, Albert Schweitzer are saying, oh, you can't be serious. Nobody could really live that way. And um, Mahatma Gandhi, the Hindu, say, actually, we should be practising the Sermon on the Mount just the way Jesus said it. No opting out, no, no special exemptions, okay? If I had to face only the Sermon on the Mount and my own interpretation of it, I would not hesitate to say, oh yes, I'm a Christian. Then he goes on to say, in my humble opinion, what passes as Christianity is a negation of the Sermon on the Mount. Strong words. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one coming up should be um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer may not be so well, be so well known these days. He was a member of the Lutheran Church in Germany during the Nazi period, and he refused to submit to the Nazi regime. So he set up an underground seminary where they were training Lutheran pastors who were not part of the uh, state church. Um, and eventually he was arrested. Um, interestingly, he participated in a plot to assassinate Hitler because he decided that was the right thing to do okay and he was actually executed just a couple of days before the end of the um, Second World War again another remarkable young um, scholar and prodigy and he wrote this amazing book called The Cost of Discipleship which was very much based on his reading of the Sermon on the Mount and, and one of his themes was there's no such thing as cheap grace Disciple. Salvation is free, but it costs you everything. An interesting kind of idea. So his, his work uh, was, and his inspiration really came from the Sermon on the Mount. And there's Martin Luther King. Um, so fast forwarding to the 60s and 70s, I guess. Um, he, he was also somebody inspired by the Sermon on the Mount. And... Um, and the whole thing of non-violent resistance, which was a big part of Gandhi's interpretation, and turn the other cheek, um, carry the bag an extra mile, not just one mile, carry the soldier's gear for an extra mile, and so on, okay? Non-violent resistance. And uh, um, absorbing the suffering, rather than trying to evade it. Get away from it. So, um, so we've got this collection of material in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, attributed to Jesus, and, and um, one of the questions scholars ask is, well, 
is this something Jesus, did he sit down one day on top of a hill and he gave this big talk? Okay? Or has Matthew kind of gathered together a whole lot of material, much of which goes back to Jesus, and he's arranged it into a, a beautiful kind of text. Um, we know that because we've got bits of the Sermon on the Mount in other places, some of it in Mark, a lot of it in Luke, we can be pretty sure that this was not, the way Matthew describes it is not a historical picture, but Matthew has gathered up, as he does in the, with the parables, he gathers it all up into one collection. Um, it's possible that someone had already done this before Matthew wrote his Gospel. Remember the sequence here is that Matthew, sorry, that Mark's Gospel comes out first, Matthew comes along and says, hmm, you've left a bit out, mate. And he does an enlarged second edition, which we call the Gospel of Matthew. And along the way, he seems to have particularly had access to a collection of sayings material, which Mark didn't use, but Luke did and Matthew did. So some people think that Matthew inherited the sermon, sort of found it in the bottom of someone's file and said, oh, I'll use, I'll use that. It was just what I need. Other people think that Matthew put it together. In any case, what we've got is a, is a collection of material coming from Jesus. It's been remembered by people over several decades, because Matthew's not written until around about 100. So, you know, 70 years have passed since Easter. And, and this material has been told and retold, used in discipleship classes and so on. And now Matthew has put it into his gospel. And, and one, of the, one of the, this goes back to the thing we saw earlier, uh, where people, some people are more interested in the teachings of Jesus, other people are really trying to understand the Jesus who appears in the Son of the Mount. I mean, he's only there in the background, but you know, some people are fascinated by Jesus, some people are fascinated by the teachings of Jesus, the wisdom of Jesus. Um, and so once we get into that, we're going down into that research area known as the quest for the historical Jesus. You know? um, what was he really like as a person? Uh, how much of the parables did he actually say? How many of the miracles did he actually do? You know, all those kind of debates. So let's have a think about how we, how the uh, Sermon on the Mount, if you like, has been received as a thing in, in scholarship called reception history. So instead of looking at how the thing got written, we can look at how did a document, um, how, how did it gain an audience? How did it get recognition and acceptance? And that's called reception history. What's the history of the book being recognized and quoted and um, revered? In this case, the reception history for the Sermon on the Mount. So we, most people, would, most scholars would assume that the uh, Sermon on the Mount has its origins in the which was a collection of very early Jesus material around the same time as Paul's letters from the 50s and 60s. But it, it's only interested in remembering the sayings of Jesus. It, it has no, basically has no miracles and, and there's no narrative. Interestingly, as far as we can tell, the Q Gospel had no reference to Easter. It was just a collection of the sayings of the Master. So that would be where it started out, according to this theory. Then both Matthew and Luke have said, oh, we can use that. And they've taken it in their own way. Uh, Matthew has moulded it into a coherent speech for the last several chapters. And Luke has used it in different places throughout his gospel. Mark, on the other hand, and John, and Paul, and even James, who you would think would be interested in this sort of stuff, as in the letter of James, doesn't seem to know about it. Has no, there's no evidence in Paul's letters, the letter of James, that any of the stuff in the Sermon on the Mount was known to them. For example, the Sermon on the Mount includes the Lord's Prayer. Paul never mentions the Lord's Prayer. Only occurs in Matthew and Luke. That's what so it's completely missing from a great chunk of the New Testament. On the other hand, there are some sections 
what we call the two ways material in a document called the Didache, sorry for my abbreviation. Uh, so the Didache and another document called the Epistle of Barnabas. And they each have a section where they they talk about there are two paths in life. And this is a piece coming out of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a straight and narrow path and there's an easy windy path. And so it could be that the Epistle of Barnabas and the what we call the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, they might represent a kind of a adaption and adoption of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, for the first, throughout the first century and into so the second century into the third century, we find lots of collections of sayings of Jesus, but after about 200, 250, they stop being made, and the Gospels that dominate are what we call the narrative Gospels, like Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. The Gospels that tell a story tend to become the official voice of the Church. So the interest in, in the wisdom of Jesus begins to disappear a little bit until, of course, we get to Augustine, as already mentioned. He actually recognises Matthew 5, 6 and 7 as a particular event, which he calls the Sermon on the Mount. The other, last thing to mention there is that for many modern people who don't have much time, perhaps, for religion, but they're still fascinated by Jesus, not church. The Sermon on the Mount is like the essential Jesus. If you really want to understand this guy, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Because the same people would say, don't read Matthew 23. He's a nasty, angry man in Matthew 23. So it's a little bit selective. But for a lot of people, the Sermon on the Mount is like the essential Jesus. If you just want to understand what Jesus was, you're not interested in church, read Matthew 5, 6, 7. It would be that kind of point of view. So, again, uh, let's look at it from the other perspective. This uh, other scholar I mentioned, Lutz, um, he's, he's, he's pointing out that you know, there's, been a, there's been an interest in the Sermon on the Mount in the, in the patristic period, but when we come down to the Reformation period, the churches of the Reformation, as he calls them, um, have actually never been interested in the Sermon on the Mount as, as a practical way for Christians to live. And it was partly that's because the churches of the Reformation were really keen on the Apostle Paul. And so they, they privileged Paul over the Gospel. So the idea that you could be saved by just doing what the Sermon on the Mount says isn't very popular amongst the Reformation kind of churches. So it's got to be, people say, you know, in effect people are saying, look at that wonderful stuff Jesus said, now don't worry about it, this is what you've got to believe. Okay, this stuff over here. So it's a kind of dichotomy in our attitude to the Sermon on the Mount. Equally, he also says, same page even, he says that any attempt to domesticate the Sermon on the Mount has completely failed. Because these are really in your face things. This is where Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. If your eye causes you to sin, rip it out. Okay? It's better to go to hell with one eye, sorry, to heaven with one eye, than to hell with two eyes. That's pretty in your face kind of stuff okay so you've got you've got two kind of different perspectives here coming out two points being made that on one hand um, you can't domesticate the sermon on the mount it's very rigorous and that that's the point that gandhi was making christianity has tried to evade the sermon on the mount with in other words they're not really wanted to buy into it that's, I think it's the same kind of tension that people like Gandhi were pointing out. If we really practice the Sermon on the Mount, um, we'd be a different kind of church. We'd be a different kind of Christian. Okay, so we just cherry pick a few bits here and there. 
So let's look at so in the in the let's look at the sermon as it occurs in Matthew itself. So in other words, not worrying about what it might have looked like before Matthew got it, but what does it look like in, in Matthew's gospel? We're aware that there's some parallels in Luke, but let's just focus on Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount. It comes with three big sections. We'll look at these in a moment. First half of chapter 5, which is basically the Beatitudes, is the introduction. Then you've got a big, long, central section. Second half of 5, all of chapter 6, first part of chapter 7, and then there's a concluding section the end of chapter 7. Now let's have a look at how this comes together. This is drawing on looks. So, one of the questions is, so what is it? Is it actually a sermon? Yeah. Is it a law code? Is it, you know, what, what is it? So, one possibility is it actually is a sermon. Um, is it a book of, a collection of basically, um, confirmation catechumen of material is this a stuff that new converts need to know possibly uh, certainly good stuff for new Christians to get their head around is it an epitome and this is the proposal from this that it's actually taking some representative samples of the, of the teaching of Jesus and gathering it together um, as a kind of um, if you like the best of Jesus DVD that picks up the best of the Beatles or the best of the Seekers is the best of Jesus according to Matthew. Um, that there's, as we know, there's more material than what we have in Matthew 5, 6 and 7 but this is the, the best of it all gathered into one unique place. Bear in mind as well the comment that we saw a few weeks ago when we did an overview of Matthew that the, um, these discourses like the Sermon on the Mount, are actually addressed to the reader. They have very little to do with the action inside the narrative of Matthew. They're very brief, they're very precise, um, and they're very hard to read, and they're very specific. You know? Do not resist evil. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile, and so on. They're very precise, they're very particular. So if you're developing a thing called epitome, you're trying to condense it down, you want to be brief, you want to be precise, but you want it to be faithful as a, as a sample which is valid and which properly represents, in this case, the teaching or the message of Jesus. Which is interesting because the Sermon on the Mount, I'm just doing a quick mental scan, the Sermon on the Mount doesn't really there's a couple of references to the kingdom or the kingdom of heaven, but basically chapters 5, 6, and 7 don't explain what the kingdom of God is, even though that's central to the message of Jesus. Okay? Interesting. It's more how do you live as a disciple of Jesus rather than explaining what the kingdom of God is. So bear that in mind as a little caveat. So, Betts is arguing that the best way to understand the Sermon on the Mount is as an epitome which tries to represent the theology of Jesus in a systematic way, but I'm adding a little footnote, well then why doesn't it actually address the Kingdom of God? Why doesn't it talk more about the Kingdom of God? Um, so we've got, actually I've got three or four, this is a long paragraph, and I hate PowerPoint slides that are full of words, okay? Just I don't need them. So I've just broken it up into four separate slides. So the first sentence, this is Betts, it's all from Betts, this bit, that the best way to understand the genre of the Sermon on the Mount is that it's meant to be an epitome which represents the theology of Jesus in a systematic fashion. Again, my disclaimer is, hmm, what about the kingdom? The next sentence from Betts, Um, is that in this case, in what we've got in this particular epitome is that the, um, the sayings of Jesus have been carefully grouped around the themes, and we'll see that in a moment when we look at the overall structure.
now he's saying, I, I love this phrase, I'm not sh sure I want to go to war with this claim, but I love this idea. Um, the, the, the point of the Sermon on the Mount is to give the disciples of Jesus the necess necessary tools to become a Jesus theologian. Okay, this stuff is meant to help us do the Jesus thing ourselves, to do our own thinking about God in a Jesus kind of way. It's not telling us the answers, it's giving us the kind of formula that we have to apply to our own life. Yeah, that's my explanation of things, you may not agree. And the last sentence from this series of quotes is, hearing and doing the sayings of Jesus means enabling the disciple to um, suggest theological words and set. <coughs> Theologize creatively along the lines of the theology of the master. <coughs> That's really just unpacking the previous sentence. What does it mean to be a Jesus theologian? Well, you, do, you think like Jesus. You look at the world through Jesus' eyes. Okay? And we're going to learn how to do that, according to Betts, by reading the Sermon on the Mount. It's a training manual for people who want to be like Jesus. It's not telling you how to be saved, it's telling you how to be a Jesus person. So, in um, Matthew's Gospel at least, not so much in the other Gospels, but very differently in Luke, but in Matthew's Gospel, this is the first time Jesus says anything of substance. So, Matthew 1 and 2, it's the Christmas story. Matthew 3 is basically, um, uh, basically going to be the baptism of Jesus, the temptation story, and so on. Through the, in chapter 4, he's beginning his ministry, beginning to call some of the disciples. And then chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes his first big speech in Matthew's Gospel. Okay? So in terms of Matthew's design... This is where Jesus, for the first time, has something to say, if you like, in the Gospel. So, he's saying it's a foundational text for the Gospel of Matthew. And he's also, whoops, also going to be saying, I think that twice, um, at the end of the Gospel, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you in the Great Commission. Okay, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, <laughs> baptizing them, teaching to observe all that I have taught you. Um, Lutz is saying, in Matthew's thinking, that means the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, maybe. Um, but they're really arguing that this is a really, if you want to understand Matthew's Gospel, you need to really pay attention to the Sermon on the Mount. Because that's one of the places where Matthew is different from Mark and Luke. Okay, and it's, the, it's where we differ from each other that makes us interesting. Mm. Where we think alike, look alike, eat alike. Yeah, okay, that's what we do. But it's actually where we differ, where we become interesting. Um, and so Luke's name is, instead of being Sermon on the Mount, and he's not going to get to change it, that was done by Augustine, but discourse on the righteousness of the kingdom of heaven. That's how, that's how Luke would understand the Sermon on the Mount. This is what it means to act rightly as part of the kingdom of heaven. So it's all those things in terms of word crowd. Okay? Um, so, uh, I think we've dealt with this this is really just what we did earlier about the um, reception. Except for this point. Um, when, I, when there's a reference to Marcion's Evangelion, or Evan Evangelion, <laughs> same thing, I'm just saying it in a brief way. Marcion, of course, was the, 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 the church's first heretic. So that's good on your business card, isn't it? Hello, my name is Marcion. I'm the first heretic in Christianity. Okay? Marcion is also the guy that gave us the New Testament. Okay? 
So, you know, I mean, he didn't mean to give us the New Testament, but in a way he did. And by because of the a line that he was pushing, the church reacted by saying, no, no, Marcia, not that, but this. And this is the New Testament, and we have it now. Mm-hmm. And that's just because of Marcia's um, attitude. Uh, Marcia's attitude. Marcia's proposal was get rid of everything from the Bible which is too Jewish, which is Jewish. Even a little bit of Jewish was too Jewish for Marcia. Okay? So get rid of Matthew. Okay? Get rid of things like the letter of James. Get rid of the Old Testament. See where this is going. So Marcion actually published a new edition of the Bible that had two bits in it. It had a gospel, a gospel, called the Evangelion or the Evangelion, and he had a, a second volume called the Apostle, which was basically Paul's letters. Everything else gone. No Peter, no James, no John, all gone. Now it's a really interesting project. This is about 140, so look, roughly 100 years after Easter. And for a while, Marcion's churches were bigger than the mainstream church. He almost won. Imagine if, imagine how different Christianity would be without the Old Testament and with nothing Jewish left in the Bible. But uh, so his the, he created a crisis, and the crisis that he created um, by, when he published the first Christian Bible, which only had the got one version of the Gospel, one set of Paul's letters. That was the trigger to say, no, no, we've got to have Matthew, we've got to have Mark, we've got to have Luke, and so on. So I just put the wrong button as I was talking. So one of the things about Marcion is that, except for a little bit of two verses out of chapter 6, everything that's in the Sermon on the Mount was actually kept by Marcion in his Gospel. It's interesting. So, so in the, like, he's like an independent witness for the, um, for the Sermon on the Mount. What was the bit that he left out? Um, Matt, uh, chapter 6, 32 and 33. You can read it for if you like. And 6, 33, you seek the first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these mm. other things will be added unto you. See, the Church of Christ upbringing never goes to waste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So there you go. So, um, according to looks, he likes to think there might have been some pre-existing material that someone else had already started to pull together, like the set of antitheses. You've heard it said of old, but I say unto you. And and also the regulations on either side of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is the stuff you read on Ash Wednesday. If you're going to fast, then put oil on your face and don't look sad and so on. Okay. But anyway, so behind Matthew's version, uh, other people have been working with this stuff. I mean, it wasn't created by Matthew, but it might have been um, assembled by Matthew, is what people are saying. And we can find bits of it elsewhere. So let's have a look at the um, two things, the outside framework and then how the inside is organised. So we'll go to the outside framework first. So just let your eyes get around that for a moment. So I'll try to colour code it so it's easier. The purple in chapter 4 matches the purple here in chapter 9. Okay? Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and sickness. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news. In other words, there's what's called an inclusio. The same thing is being said here and here, and in an ancient text, that's a way of bracketing something. Saying, oh, so the bits in between are meant to be a separate section. Then we have the bits in black here. His fame spread everywhere. Matthew even has through Syria, which is clearly wrong, but that's what Matthew says. Okay. He's in Galilee, he's not in Syria, but anyway. Um, they brought him sick, and down here, that evening they brought to him many who were possessed with demons. Cast out the spirits with the word, cure with all of the sick. 
So again, we've got a sort of second inclusio. And then the blue, great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, beyond the Jordan, and down here, a great crowds followed him. So you get the idea that around the Sermon on the Mount, there are like three rings of, um, or in some cases, almost identical verses that are kind of helping the reader go, whoops, hang on, haven't I heard this before? Let me go, ah, so there's something about this I've got to pay attention to. Okay. And then what you've got, and then you've got Jesus going up the mountain, Jesus coming down from the mountain. Okay, so fourth kind of ring. This is this structure outside. So the sermon itself, which is chapter 5, verse 2, chapter 7, verse 29, is surrounded by all this duplication to sort of draw attention to the, to the sermon itself. So now we look, now we're going to look at just the red bits. So this is what we're looking at in the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing. Okay? So we're told where it is, we get the introduction, which is uh, basically the Beatitudes, plus the sayings about salt and light, and a city set on a hill. And at the other end, we're going to have how people reacted to that, and just before that, you're going to have a conclusion, which is going to more or less match the introduction. Then we're going to come up, make our way into the sermon through various steps. And what Lutz is saying, this is from Lutz's commentary on Matthew, at the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. Interesting. Okay. Like the Lord's Prayer doesn't happen up here or right here. It's right in the middle. And again, we've got a whole series of theological circles, word circles around it. We've got prayer words. We've got being righteous before God. Um, we've got, uh, you've heard it said of old that I'm telling you, and now we're getting stuff about how to, uh, you know, you don't hang on to possessions and so on. Um, you've got your preface, you've got your golden rule. So what, what Lutz is suggesting is that the Sermon on the Mount is a very carefully constructed piece of theological writing by Matthew. And at the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount is actually the Lord's Prayer. So what Matthew is creating here is a kind of a, a manual for the members of the church in Antioch. This is the stuff you need to know. And this is the prayer that sums it all up. Because if you live the Lord's Prayer, Let's just stay there for a bit, see if you've got any questions, observations, because that's we, we tend not to notice this. We just flick through our Bible and we say chapter 5, followed by chapter 6, followed by chapter 7. We tend not to notice how this paragraph matches this paragraph and so on. So this is looking at it, trying to get a sense of how the overall thing is structured. And particularly that this appears to so the point of this kind of structure is the bit in the middle for which there is no parallel, that's ground zero. That's the whole structure is about this bit here, whatever it happens to be. So when you've got A, B, C, D, E, and then you have you know, D1, uh, C1, B1, A1. Um, when you have that sort of structure, what it's saying is pay attention to the one in the middle. That's what it's all about. Doesn't mean this stuff's not important, but all of this stuff, the way Matthew is structured it, is saying, live the Lord's Prayer. Don't just say it, live it. Greg, I'm a bit of embarrassed to say, uh, to ask the question, but um, the golden rule, is that do unto others? Yeah. All right. I just have to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't feel embarrassed at all. <laughs> yes. No, it's just one verse. Now, the problem with this sort of proposal, you say, oh, so, so this one is one verse, 
Whereas up here you've got three verses, and up here you've got four or five. I mean, oh, this, this one goes from 21 to 48. These are, these are not even-sized bites. But what, what he's saying is, I mean, this section obviously hangs together. It's six statements, all of which say, start off by saying, you've heard it was said of old, but I'm telling you, ah. So these are not even bites. They're uneven pieces of text. But he's, he's suggesting a very uh, intentional structure where this parallels this kind of thing, and that right in the very center of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. It's quite a clever man to work all that out, don't you think? To even suggest all that. Well, when you, <laughs> yeah, and it's the same as the previous <laughs> slide where we had these, slide. these things. It's partly when, you, when you're reading the text closely, particularly in the original language, you go, oh, hang on, that's the same as this, or well, that's the same as this, but this isn't. So you begin to, and, and of course, the way we, in church, we mostly hear a paragraph at a time in the lectionary. We, these days, we rarely sit down and listen to a whole chapter being read, or three chapters being Two exceptions, Palm Sunday and Good Friday, where we do read the Passion story as a whole. But normally in church, we hear a paragraph at a time, and mostly in mainstream churches, Catholics, Anglicans, whatever, people are not don't have their Bible open while that paragraph's being read. If they did, they would notice what comes before or what's on the opposite but they're just reading what's in the bulletin. Mm -hmm. So they're not seeing the context. And it's even worse if you use a phone or an iPad to do your Bible reading, because you, if, you if you do a search, yeah, control F, Luke, or you just go into Google, search Luke 6, colon 1 to 12, that's all you will see on the screen. You won't see verse 13. You won't see the last verse of chapter five. Okay, so, um, yeah, but if you use a remus, you can flick to the next. No, we don't. <laughs> because we become lazy. We only see what's on the screen. When you're using a book, yeah. you do actually you tend to notice what comes before and after. So our way of processing and hearing the Bible is changing. And particularly the people that are still coming to church on Sundays, what they're getting is the lectionary. So they're getting a paragraph a week. And they tend not to get the context. And so we're dumbing the congregation down, mm -hmm. in effect, in terms of Bible knowledge. Don't mean to, but that's what's happening. Because we're not, when I was a kid, everybody in the church had a copy of the Bible open on their lap. And as Mr. Smith was reading it, we'd be following along. And in the meantime, you'd notice other bits that were open at the same time. Kathy, do you have a question? I thought you... Oh, well, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So, for me, it's, I, I find it fascinating, personally, the idea that for Matthew's church, the Lord's Prayer was that important. Around about 100 AD or thereabouts, 100, 110 in Antioch, up in, the, in southern Turkey today, um, they had all this material about the teaching of Jesus, wonderful stuff, I mean, the Beatitudes, the Antitheses, Things about don't be anxious about possessions and so on. But at the heart of it was the Lord's Prayer. So this is taking us, I think, into the spirituality of Christians in Antioch around about 100 AD, which I find very fascinating. Mm. Particularly since Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer is different. And I think Matthew inherited this from the Jew Gospel. And he had Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer in front of him, and he said, I think, this is purely speculation, I think Matthew said, no, I'm going to put in the version of the Lord's Prayer that we use at church on Sunday. So I think what we're getting in Matthew 6, 9 to 13, is the Lord's Prayer as it was said at Antioch, around about 100 AD. What we're getting in Luke, chapter 11, is the earlier version of the Lord's Prayer, but that wasn't how it was said at Antioch. For me, that's something I find interesting. And if you forgive, God forgives you. Yeah. 
any other questions about it so that we go on. There's more and more stuff, but um, but we don't need to go into chapter five and say, oops, sorry, wrong button. Come back from here. Anything else about the Lord about the Sermon on the Mount? We just want to kick around a bit. We've got about eight minutes left. So it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Um, just a reminder, so 13 to 16 is basically the Beatitudes, plus the sayings about uh, salt, if salt has lost its flavour, and about a light, you don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel and so on. That's what you put up here. Um, this is about, this is the section where Jesus said, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. That's an important message for a church which has very strong Jewish roots, like the church in Antioch. Okay? Because really, what Matthew is doing in this section, he's painting Jesus like Moses. Moses goes up the mountain to get from God the Ten Commandments to give to the people. Jesus goes up the mountain. He doesn't have to get the Ten Commandments from God. He gives the commandments because he is God. And particularly when you get down to the antithesis, you've heard it said of old, you shall not kill, but I am telling you, you shall not hate. You shall not speak harshly. I mean, whatever. So you see his, his increase, he's turning up the demand. He's acting like God, giving the law on top of the mountain. So what Matthew is doing here, in a sense, is saying, Jesus is like Moses, only he's bigger than Moses. Okay? So he's not throwing out the law. If anything, he's making the law more rigorous. He's making it more demanding. Questions? Greg, can you remind me again? Um, so Matthew was a Jew, but what was his background? Just quickly, like, because we you talk about how he has the capacity to structure his in this way. What was it, was he a? I mean, was he well educated, or was he a, like what? I'm just I have heard sure. it, but I can't sure. remember. That's okay. So when I'm saying Matthew, I don't actually mean Matthew. One of the twelve disciples. Yeah, you're talking about the whole. Gospel, I'm talking yeah. about the Matthew, whoever it was that wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah. And so the Gospel of Luke, we call him Luke, but I mean, yeah. we don't actually know who it was. Mm -hmm. Even Mark, we, I mean, it doesn't say in the Gospel of Mark, "Hello, this is Mark. I'm writing." <laughs> you know, it's just beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Behold, a boy is in the desert. You know, da, 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 da. We say, "Oh, that's Mark's Gospel." That's because in the oldest manuscripts, when you get to the end, it says the gospel according to Mark. But it's not actually in the text itself, it's just on the label. So whoever, so we're trying to work out, so what kind of guy, what kind of person is writing Matthew? Um, it's clearly somebody who is very Jewish, wants to hang on to the Jewishness of Jesus as much as possible. Yeah. Now, that's not groundbreaking news because all the followers of Jesus initially were Jewish. I mean, that's, you know, Paul was Jewish, Peter was Jewish. I mean, they're all, they're all Jewish. But the Christian church quickly jumped the fence. And Paul's people were mostly Gentiles. But Matthew appears to be writing for a more Jewish, a church which is still kind of hang on to its Jewishness. So if we analyse how Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew is written, is, would we surmise from it that the person who's writing or the person who's writing it would be have a fairly high academic background themselves or a highly educated background themselves? Just um, simply by the way that they're like you talk, it's quite a, yeah. a clever structure that you're talking yeah. about. It's quite a. This is somebody a, who's got some basic training in how to how to write for instructional purposes yeah. in the Jewish community and the, and the Greco Roman. What sort of person would that be in that time, in that, from a historical perspective? Um, okay, no, good question. So, who can read and write in first century Palestine? Yeah. Not very many people. Yeah. Okay. 65, 70% of the people, Leanne's about to start smiling, this is our lesson. <laughs> 
pick up the next in the year five and six, but 60 to 70% of the people are peasants. Yeah. They can't read and write. 5% are artisans, but they're not tradies with a beach house. These are farmers that have lost their land and they've got to scrape together a living by being blacksmiths or stonemasons or whatever. You talked about Joseph being... That's the family of Jesus. Jesus is not a peasant kid, he's an artisan kid, a blacksmith's kid, a carpenter's kid. Mm. And they had no social status. Mm. Below them there's another 5% of people that are doing really dirty jobs you know, that are, make them literally unclean. And, and, be, and so they're really desperate. Think a prodigal son. Yeah. Okay? And below that there's another 10% who are called the expendables they're going to end up rowing the slave ships, working in the salt mines, they're going to be dead within six months. So that's 10%, 5%, 5%, 60%. So we're already up to about 80, 85% of people below the poverty line, basically. None of them can read and write, basically, including Jesus. It would be remarkable for him to be able to read and write. Because nobody taught peasant children in Galilee blacksmith's children in Galilee did not get sent to school because there's no economic reason to do that. <coughs> there's no benefit to the family in sending that kid to school. And there wasn't a school to send them to. So above that, you've got um, the merchants and they have a function because they bring the nice stuff that the rich people want to have. They get on camels and boats and go far, far away and they bring back exotic stuff. Above them are the priests. There's not that many of them, but the priests own about or control about 15% of the land in the country. So they're actually very wealthy. But not as personal. I don't own this because I'm also a church. <laughs> Join the Franciscans, see the world. Um, above them are the retainers. They're the tax collectors and so on. And, and the secretaries, the people that can read the stars and calculate the calendar when it's time to harvest or plant and so on. And so, and again, they're about five, ten percent because we've only got you know fifteen percent left when you take out all the rest. And then you've got the ruler. There's only one of him, but they get bumped off every so often because someone else wants the top job. So the only people that can read and write are not going to be the ruler necessarily, unless they've been tutored. People that can read and write are the retainers, the priests, and the merchants. Because they have an economic reason to be literate. The merchant needs to maintain his inventory, mm. keep a track of what he paid for and how much he's going to get for it. Okay? The priests, they're really good at collecting taxes and knowing when to, when, and they've, they've got to learn to read the stars and keep dates and calendars. Because if you offer the sacrifice on the wrong day, God will not be happy, according to their system. Which is why we're precious, you know, we're looking after us, we're priests in the old ancient world. And then you've got the retainers who are the, the scholars and the historians and the generals and the ruling class, but they're not the ruler, and they help the system keep going. And they're the ones who actually get sent to school. And maybe they're the school teachers who are teaching the sons of the ruler, teaching the merchants, and so on. So whoever is, re whoever is writing the Gospels, not just Matthew, has to come out of that, those top three layers. Um, they're not going to come from anywhere else. <coughs> Greg, I'm very good at these um, irrelevant questions. Sorry. Yeah, hold, hold your question. We'll go to the okay. lady behind you no, first. No, sorry. It's okay. It's a, on that you, you go first and then Kate. I was just going <coughs> to ask you, uh, with the lit you know, the literacy of Jesus, wasn't there a place, we all as theologians need to know where, where he stands up and reads from the yeah, scroll? Luke chapter four. In the, yeah, and, and says, you know, in your hearing this is... Yes, yeah. there is. So Luke imagined Jesus is literate because Luke can't imagine Jesus being less educated than himself. Right. And we can't either. The idea of Jesus as being illiterate is something we struggle with. So when he but a studied boy at the, from the Galilee is going to be illiterate. So when he studied, because he spent time, you know, even when he went missing and his parents were looking for him, and he said, "Where will I be? But in my father's house." 
like smoking. And it. he's sitting at the feet of the teachers. Yeah, it's all. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. That's good. He is Christ, but <laughs> <laughs> he is the Christ. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's all oral tradition, what you're saying. Well, it's it's not even oral, no, it's not oral tradition. It's written tradition, and it only starts in Luke. Luke has made all that up. Because Luke is writing for an educated Roman audience. So he has to present Jesus as an educated Jewish boy who could hang out with them. And that's what Luke does. Um, and look, but the particular Jesus as a 12 year old, that's part of a, Luke's infancy story. It's different from Matthew in all kinds of ways, including they don't go to Egypt and there aren't any wise men and Herod's not killing anybody. But in Luke's infancy story, there are seven scenes, and Jesus, the 12 year old, is scene number seven. So it's the climax of the infancy story. And the first six stories are a story about John the Baptist, a story about Jesus, a story about John the Baptist, a story about Jesus, a story about John the Baptist, a story about Jesus. One of these boys is the man to watch. Number seven is the 12 year old Jesus in the temple. He's obviously the guy to watch. Mm -hmm. But the founding myth of Rome is the story of Romulus and Remus, the twin boys, one of whom is going to become the founder of Rome. Mm -hmm. So I think Luke is telling the story of John the Baptist and Jesus mm -hmm. so that for Romans, they go, ah, oh, we know a story about two boys. One of these boys is going to become the ruler of the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's Jesus in Luke's Gospel. So, so Luke imagines Jesus being literate and actually being on the reading roster at the synagogue in Nazareth. But there probably wasn't a synagogue in Nazareth and it certainly wasn't on the edge of a cliff from which they could throw Jesus off because there aren't any cliffs in Nazareth. But Luke is imagining Nazareth as being like Athens and the Acropolis as being the synagogue and they're going to throw Jesus off the Acropolis in Nazareth. Luke has never been to Nazareth, and he's writing for a Greek and Roman audience. That's my take on it. Now, Jesus is clearly brilliant. Mm. Um, for ministry, and so did John. He would be illiterate. But, You're saying he's oral, illiterate too? Well, Jesus is an oral performer, an oral artist. Mm. Um, as far as we know, even if Jesus could read and write, which is most unlikely, he never wrote anything down for his followers to keep. There's no, there's nothing that says we've got this, but Jesus wrote it down, or even Jesus dictated it for someone else to write down. There's nothing in the Gospels that suggests Jesus was creating literature. Mm. And it's only in Luke that he suddenly is pretty fancy, and obviously has an education. So then we've got to make sense of that and try to say, well, hang on, how do we, how do we make? I'm not always right. I'm just. I'm just <laughs> I don't think well, you've got to believe that. I'm just. That's how I make sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think you can eliminate the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you know, in these men's lives, this is what I believe anyway, was a powerful force sure. to, you know, make sure that the gospel was created so that 2,000 years later we can read it and be followers of Christ. Yep. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, that's why I might have tried to hold it his but The Holy Spirit working in their lives doesn't necessarily mean they suddenly become educated even though they never went to school. I mean, no, no, very, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. That's a very precise... Yeah, no, that's not what I'm yeah, saying. Sure, we all yeah. believe that... Um, not that we think the Holy Spirit... You know, we're getting into, we're start tripping over the Trinity very quickly, but we'd all agree that the Spirit of God was completely present and working through Jesus. Yeah. Okay, we're, we are out of time now. No, I'll, I'll leave my question to later. Oh.